Good evening, everybody. So, good evening. Um, so, my name's Wynne Bowen. I'm the head of the School of Security Studies here at King's, for at least for another three more months or so. And then I hand over to my, to my successor. Um, so, welcome to King's. Welcome to Bush House, this great room. We do a lot of events in here. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a big uh, week of events for us at King's. Big Defense of Europe conference yesterday, today's cybersecurity series. Uh, and a few more things later on in the week. So um, this is the inaugural event, obviously, of the King Cybersecurity Seminar Series, um, sponsored by Dell, and also on the, on the series working with 2020 partners as well. Um, King's, as you probably know, is a recognized center for cybersecurity research and engagement. Uh, and we are a NCSE EPSRC Academic Center of Excellence uh, for cybersecurity research and have had that um, title, I guess, since uh, 2018. And the School of Security Studies here um, uh, is involved in the third pillar of that activity around strategic cybersecurity. So the socio-political aspects of cyber, cyber risks and threats, cyber intelligence, policy, defense-related issues, and then the relationship of all those to um, you know, risk assessment, risk management, uh, and governance and the like. Um, and the King's Cybersecurity Research Group, which is led by Tim Stevens, where's Tim? Over there. Um, is a fundamental part of the work that King's does uh, in this area. The group under Tim has grown to about 50 or so uh, academics, uh, policy people, visiting fellows, etc. Uh, and there's a real vibrant hub here at King's for work on cybersecurity issues. In the War Studies Department, colleagues from our Defence Studies Department, which is based at the Defence Academy at Shrivenham, working with the Armed Forces, our Department of Informatics here. Uh, the School of Law, our global institutes, and, and other, other parts of the organization. Uh, and the group engages regularly with government, research networks, uh, and everything else too, and also gets involved in cybersecurity education, not just with our normal students here, but also with uh, practitioners uh, as well. So this King's Dell sort of initiative um, with the seminar series is, is a really important new step, I think, uh, in terms of furthering that conversation between industry uh, and academia, and we're very, very excited about it. For me, these sorts of things are about creating new knowledge and understanding and communicating it across the different stakeholders that we have in subject areas like, like this, like cyber. So you've got a great set of speakers tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to it, um, and I'll hand over. Great. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending this evening. We have a great panel ahead of us. I'm Dane Turbot. I look after Dell Technologies business in the UK. Um, it may be surprising to you that the laptop manufacturer is here um, sponsoring a cybersecurity practice, but we, we currently have about a $3.5 billion business in security, um, whether that's in the BIOS, on the laptop, through intrinsic security in the servers, but then more importantly to operational resilience and standing up things like Skeleton Bank and some of the work that we do with Sheltered Harbor. I see Jim Shook in the audience. So if you want to know what that means, ask Jim, because I have no idea. <laughs> But um, we have a great panel tonight. I'm very excited about this series. So thank you for the partnership with Kings and for 2020. And let me hand you over to Liz, who will facilitate the conversation this evening. Liz, thank all you. yours. Thanks, Dane. Hello, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here at the first inaugural Kings College event. So really great to be joined by so many thinkers in the audience from the public sector, from business, from technology, and from academia. I'm also joined by a wonderful panel. We have Lord Toby Harris, who's head of the UK National Preparedness Commission. We have Patty McGuinness, OBE, who's the former UK Deputy National Security Advisor, and Josh Jaffe, who is the Vice President of Cybersecurity at Dell Technologies. I am Liz Green, Cybersecurity Leader at Dell Technologies. I will be your host and facilitator for today's discussion. Firstly, thank you to those who are here in London. So great to see so many of you and meet all of you. So it's been great to have a, a few different discussions before the event started. And for those that have joined on Zoom, we are delighted to have you. A few things on how tonight is gonna run. We are gonna have a panel discussion, but before that, we're gonna have some really great insights shared from Lord Harris. After that, we will have a Q&A. The Q&A will be uh, for those in the room, following Chatham House rules. So if you do think of a question, please write it down. And I have a few people I've already told I'm going to pick on, so that'll be great. 
Um, without further ado, it would be great, Lord Harris, just to have a few insights from your good self. Well, thank you very much. And thanks in particular to King's College uh, and to Dell for uh, making this happen. Um, as you've gathered, I chair the uh, UK's National Preparedness Commission. This brings together, for those who don't know, 46 leading figures from public life, academia, business and civil society with the rather grand aim of trying to promote better preparedness for a major inc crisis or incident. And COVID has taught us quite how vital this is. The speed with which the norms of society unravel with deserted city centres, businesses shut down, and forced social distancing and mask wearing came as a shock to many people. But actually, we should have been ready. Epidemics have occurred traumatically throughout history. Pandemic has been in the top tier of the UK's National Risk Register since it was first published uh, well over a decade ago. And so far, 2022 has brought us the war in Ukraine, escalating supply chain issues and near double digit inflation. And it's only just into May. At our first meeting, I think 18 months ago, the Commission was warned that irrespective of COVID, we're living in a world that is increasingly volatile and unstable. The UK's current National Risk Register maps 38 major risks facing the country, including environmental hazards, major incidents, malicious attacks, both cyber-based and terrorist, risks arising overseas, and inevitably, animal and human diseases. However, it was prepared before the invasion of Ukraine and does not, as far as I can tell, mention significantly supply chain issues or supply chain disruption and energy market instability, let alone possible Russian retaliation for the stance that the EU and NATO have taken. So the lesson from this, the overriding lesson, actually in every country, is that we have probably not been investing sufficiently in our general preparedness and resilience. Not that it's easy. In essence, we have to predict the unpredictable, prepare for the uncertain, and recognize that some of it will be wrong. And being properly prepared and resilient is expensive. The increasing complexity of our society and its systems, of course, brings many benefits, but it potentially creates its own fragilities. And adopting a preparedness philosophy means parking our just-in-time approach in favour of just-in-case and being ready to build in redundancy and avoid interdependence. And if you like, that reverses 40 years of eliminating redundancy, making things more efficient and making things far more inter interdependent. And that's bad enough for the public sector but it's probably even more so in the corporate sector, particularly in a world with an increasing focus on annual returns and quarterly figures. And of course, there is NIMTO, not in my term of office. Now, I am a recovering politician. <laughs> so I know how difficult it is for our elected leaders to devote resources, by which I mean tax revenues, to projects that do not come to fruition by the time of the next election or even the one after it, or to build resilience that probably uh, is probably invisible and may never be needed for an eventuality that may never happen. And it's usually impossible to prove that your actions have prevented something happening, particularly if that hypothetical event is at some indeterminate time in the future and almost certainly long after your term of office is forgotten. So the task the National Preparedness Commission has set itself, and indeed I think it's a task for all of us, has to be to focus on three questions. What should we prepare for? How much preparedness is enough? And even more difficult, how do we finance the necessary investment? Now, these cannot just be questions for national government. And there is a welcome recognition of this in last year's integrated review. Most of the public discussion of that review focused on the defence and foreign policy content. But in my view, the most important section was building resilience at home and abroad. 
and that explicitly promises a comprehensive national resilience strategy expected soon um, and that that strategy should be based on a whole of society approach involving individuals businesses and organizations and that chimes with what the National Preparedness Commission has been saying since it was established that if you make every level of government every organization and every community more resilient you can create a sort of if I dare use the phrase a sort of herd immunity for a society better able to address future global crises whether it's a new pandemic a massive cyber attack or climate change and it's also true for every household and every individual we all have our part to play and in the context of cyber and indeed many other threats preparedness has to be two-pronged first we need to reduce the, the likelihood of an attack succeeding and this is where effective cyber defenses come in but second you have to assume failure you have to assume that an attack could get through so can you manage and maintain your key services and protect your most precious data under those circumstances and how quickly can you recover and how do you further strengthen your systems against future attacks now it is of course a truism that generals always prepare to fight the last war rather than the one that is actually coming so David o. Oman, who I'm daunted to see is sitting immediately <coughs> opposite me the former UK um, security coordinator cast, recast it in a diff slightly different way he said what we prepare for we deter so what we actually experience by way of events is alas what we have not prepared for and the reality is that our nations our cities and communities and our organizations have to have preparedness and resilience designed in it has to be part of society's fabric and that preparedness has to be event neutral it might be cyber it might be the closing down of the state state because of uh, uh, of covid and actually if you design it in it's much easier than trying to fit it in afterwards i spent an hour and a half earlier on this afternoon uh, celebrating the progress that's been made on the westminster ceremonial streetscape uh, for those who don't know this is the long-term plan to remove unsightly concrete blocks which are there to prevent vehicle uh, borne attacks and replace them with rather more elegant gates and physical barriers which look as though they were part of the original uh, arrangements so if you walk down Whitehall you will see a series of palisades on either side which look as though they date from the rest of Whitehall the reality is they're there they've been very carefully designed and they were all in use today but that point is design it in design it early and be prepared to make that investment and I think that's the context for this evening's discussion <coughs> thank you Thank you, Lord Harris. Really valuable insights and I think really sets us up for a productive discussion tonight and hopefully some following questions. So I think expanding on this, Lord Harris, it would be really great to hear a little bit more about the role that cybersecurity has played during your time, both as the chair of the UK National Preparedness Commission and while working for the Mayor of London. And I will say particularly as you consider the city's readiness in the event of a terrorist attack. Well, I think the my approach is to say that cyber is one of a number of threats that we face um, and it of course became extremely fashionable at one stage and a lot of resources were made available for it but actually you need to be able to respond to that to cyber you need to be able to respond to power failures you need to be able to respond to uh, interruptions in your supply chain the significance of for example power failures or for that matter a massive cyber attack is how dependent our systems are all on them or are all on those elements there's another point i talked about herd immunity cyber is the possible exception to that because your cyber security will depend on what is your weakest link rather than i mean yes you do improve things by everybody generally improving their cyber hygiene but you don't um if, if your key supplier or somebody has let in the virus then you are not uh, th then that's your weakest link and so it's not just about um, um, 
herd immunity in that case. You've got to look at your whole network, you've got to look at your supply chains, but also, are you protecting your crown jewels, your most important intellectual property, or the most significant um, services that you provide? And there's a piece of work that we did for the National Preparedness Commission, which looked at the experience of, of business leaders during COVID, which identified that the ones who were most agile in terms of responding to uh, situations were the most effective, but also those who were clearest about what were the most important things within their business, within their organisation, and making sure that those happened and that those were protected. And it's the same principle as far as cyber is concerned. Thank you, Lord Harris, really helpful. And I think actually ties well into a question I had for you, Patty. We're talking a lot here about how do we prepare um, what does leadership look like? Um, and I think you, you have a lot of experience working as national security advisor and more recently as an advisor to executive boards. You've been in the room with organizations that have been impacted by more catastrophic incidents. What are they thinking and what are some practical tips or guidance um, for people in the room that you know, might be on those boards as well? You know, how can we be more prepared? Liz, thanks for the question, and, and Toby, thank you for the framing, which I think is really strong. I'm very conscious that in the room here and quite possibly online, we have a set of um, people who either are on boards or in executive teams and will have a view on what I now say, so please do tackle me if I, you think I've got it wrong. Um, there are regularly surveys done of uh, leaders as to what's on the top of their mind. And one was done earlier this year by PricewaterhouseCooper. They do a very good one, which is of all their CEO customers. Uh, and, and cyber risk, cyber disruption was very high on the agenda. In fact, it was the top risk they specified. And that wasn't because CEOs have an intrinsic interest in IT systems. Uh, it was because they couldn't bear another period of business disruption after the one with COVID, no matter how agile they were, and they wanted to be prepared. And critically, they recognized that it was a hard to price risk, which means it was difficult to get assurance and be confident that they were well postured to deal with it. A and um, regret is rarely a useful um, uh, emotion. I'm not sure my wife thinks that, but still, uh, uh, it, it rather saps the energy. Um, um, but boards who suffer events, or, or if they're lucky, have near misses and kind of have that, like a, when your car skids moment, where the, you know, the adrenaline goes in and it makes you think a little bit, usually there are kind of three or four things that they wish they'd done or they then do. So, and here they are from my, my lived experience looking after tens of boards through events since I left government. Um, so the first one is that they wish that they had pulled through measures to strengthen their security architecture more quickly. And it isn't that many businesses now don't have programs of work like this, it's that frankly they are too often complacent about how fast they're coming through. They are often doing the right things, but not quite fast enough or not with enough de determination. And, and you know, there are people more expert than me in the audience here uh, about you know, but network segmentation, enhanced monitoring, control of identity, disciplines about data holdings, what data is held where, elimination of legacy systems or products or domains, and projection of this down the supply chain all feature. And where businesses have done this, to any degree, they fare better uh, when they uh, have an event. And you know, we can all cite examples of that. I'm happy to do so in Q&A. Secondly, my word, and this goes to your point, Toby, they wish they had prepared for what uh, colleagues from CCS would call reasonable worst case scenarios, yeah? uh, including critically a focus on recovery. And I'd note from my lived experience with businesses that often the most neglected element is real thought about what recovery is like. That isn't recovery of the ability to deliver a service to the client or the customer, although that really matters, doesn't it, if you're in CNI, critical national infrastructure. But, but actually, that's about getting back to a state where your business is capable, again, of being agile and of responding and you know, running through a technology transformation program. In my lived experience with ransomware, the shortest full recovery to a state prior to the event, having learned the lessons of it, was six months. 
That was the shortest, and that was when there'd been a four-day incident, uh, and they hadn't really crossed a threshold. And then they wished, they all wished that they had structured arrangements with external partners, able to re reinforce their response and recovery. Now, this isn't about the insurance panel of the remediation company, the lawyer, and the comms firm, um, although all of that matters, but this is absolutely about um, the technology and security partners who are going to help you put your network or your servers or your architecture back together again. I would note that when we get a systemic event, and I could cite an example in Victoria or Australia if you want to ask me about it, when you get a systemic event, the market dries up. Those who are insured or have pre-booked their partnerships get all the support and others don't, whether or not they should have it for societal purpose. Mm. So there's something really important about thinking about who's going to fix this. It is never just the internal team, ever. And then lastly, they wish that they had worked on their own personal and collective resilience and that of their staff. And the most frightening moment of some of you who've been in Cobra's Cobra meetings and Situation Room meetings with me will know, the most frightening moment is when you have a new set of ministers and they've never been in a situation like this together before, but they all know they need to assert, each other, assert themselves, and they're all exhausted and, and worried, and then they lean forward and start. And then, you know, you're in trouble, right? You, boards and leadership teams, and indeed our staff, who are the people who repair things and put them right, and also represent an attack surface and a risk during a cyber incident, my word, they need to have resilience built in, and that needs to be planned. Lindy Cameron, uh, who the CEO of our National Cybersecurity Centre, made a very telling point, I thought, last summer, when asked about what she recommended to business leaders, thinking of how to prepare for a ransomware event, was the example for her. And she said, speak to folk who have gone through an event to understand the dy dynamic. Uh, and it's absolutely what I see in a, in a, um, uh, a cyber crisis practice that I, I live, and Toby has described it, You've got to believe this can happen to you and that your world, the bottom can fall out of your world and prepare yourself for that and not have a false complacency. I think that's the thing people wish most. Really helpful. Thank you so much. I don't know if this mic is working now, but I'm hoping yeah. it is. Um, I, I think there's a lot of practical insights, so hopefully everyone has been able to take some of those down. For, for me, really being able to think about how we recover, think about how, how long it takes, I think some of those data points about you know a five-day incident taking months to recover, something I see a lot, and I know quite a few of us as well. Um, and then thinking about personal resilience of teams, so really helpful there. It would be great, Josh, now kind of to, to talk to you a bit more from a US lens. We've talked a lot about the UK and, and what we're doing from uh, a national level, what, what some of the government and uh, businesses here are looking at. But what, what about the US? What are you seeing that may be different or similar? How are people leading in this space? What insights can you share? It would be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely happy to do that and certainly happy to have a chance to, to share a little bit um, of my experience with the group, but also hopefully have a chance to listen and, and learn and share in the learning um, in the Q&A portion. Maybe a, a couple points of view in answer to your question, but um, for, and I'll answer that both as a US security leader and CISO, but also formerly a, a CISO of a European corporation as well. I think there's probably more similarities than differences. In fact, there are substantially more similarities than differences. Um, a couple that I'll, I'll key on from the outset. I, I think though one of the high level things that maybe is most important, at least from my point of view, uh, for us to recognize when we talk about sort of the way that we both regulatory frameworks and risk help us structure the way we think about and respond to cyber attacks is that it's it's critically important for us to be able to leverage or take to take the learnings from those regulations to point specifically to, I think, Patty, your example of the kinds of things that we really should be doing and doing faster. I think you made the point of whenever you have a chance to talk with a board on this topic, they very regularly will have a list of things they were already doing that they didn't quite do in time. And I think done right, the perspective of a regulatory authority or regulation, um, the frameworks that are built give a push, give an impetus to do things that are already known to be the right practices. So for example, we talked about cyber resiliency. I, internally at Dell, and, and I'm, I'm sure across the, 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 the landscape of, of corporate entities that are, are uh, attending here, is, it's, quite, it's quite reasonable to foresee a day 
where you, you can imagine the experience like, like you were describing, uh, Toby, the, the very foreseeable possibility that we ourselves may, or a customer or somebody that we you know will be in a position where we're responding to one of those bad day events. So knowing that ahead of time and planning for it is critically important. I think we have a, a point of view around the need to have what we consider to be a air-gapped um, protect, protected capability around our critical data, the things that we need to recover our business. We should be able to be sure that we have access to those even in that worst case scenario. So knowing those things and moving them forward, a layered set of controls, specifically understanding that we can expect, we can predict that different ones of those controls will be more or less effective in a different kind of crisis, and planning for the failure, not the success of some of those, right? We, I think that the point around deterrence is a, a relevant one. We, the things we experienced are the things that we didn't successfully deter, which means there was a failure likely in planning or preparing for those events. So preparing for failure is important. We, we get a chance to talk with our customers regularly. We do a survey similar to the one you referenced, Patty, where we go out and ask customers and potential customers the things they're most worried about. Increasingly, ransomware is at the top of the list, and increasingly, the people we talk to are not confident that they'll be able to recover from a ransomware attack, right? So those kinds of recognitions, things you can plan for and understand the systemic implication of, critically important. I think in addition to that notion of compelling things we already know are good to happen faster, um, th there's also the notion that um, we have the opportunity to sort of bend a curve, which is going the wrong direction institutionally. The, the notion of herd immunity that you mentioned, Toby, really resonates with me. I, I think if we, we see the trajectory of cybercrime and ransomware in particular, that is not just the result of a particular institution's failure to deter ransomware crime, but it's the recognition that as long as there continue to be soft targets in, in the world, in the economy, in institutions, we will regularly encounter these problems and they will continue to get worse, not get better, right? So the notion that each organization, each entity has an opportunity to strengthen their cyber resiliency and improve their posture in a way that they themselves will be a harder target for ransomware, that collectively has an impact on the whole, which again creates a more herd immune culture, right? A more, a, a more resistant civil society which I think is important. And again, I think the notion of both sort of regulatory frameworks, but also um, risk-based strategies have a considerable um, part to play. I, I guess I'd say the last thing that maybe occurs to me though, is there's also the opportunity for things that are a good idea in a moment, combat, combating a present problem, to if not modernize with the times and the threats we face to also create a risk of resources being forced to be allocated against a thing that no longer exists. So in the moment we're describing now, all of our technology, our companies, our institutions are all very technology dependent. We will likely be for the foreseeable future. Ransomware is a considerable threat to that. It is also though important to realize, like hopefully is um, the case with some of the other um, viruses and pandemics that we we've been facing that we as a society come to a point where the the need to institute controls against old threats maybe become less important and new ones mm -hmm. emerge. So oftentimes we find that we are, organizations are regularly forced to continue to maintain, maintain a set of standards or controls against things that maybe once existed but in the future no longer are as prescient. So I think an opportunity to go back and look at the things that maybe have historically existed, the requirements we have historically for different kinds of cyber hygiene and re modernize or reappropriate some of that emphasis in a way that allows us to be more, more flexible with the way that we apply our resources to the future, I think certainly an opportunity for, for all our organizations to, to consider. Really helpful, thank you, Josh. And I think it's good to know <clears throat> from a US lens that we're seeing you know, similar trends and focus on resilience and recovery. Um, so really helpful. I think you know we have time for one more question and I would hope maybe each of you can just share a comment or two on this. Um, but you know what we're seeing with a lot of organizations today is a focus on um, ESG, so environmental, societal, and governance. Um, one thing we're really looking at is how can organizations or should organizations be responsible? You know, we've, we've acknowledged here that there is 
uh, a need to be resilient and that organizations need to look at threats, be it cyber or otherwise. Um, who is responsible for this and how do we build that responsibility into the framework of the businesses and the organizations that we have? Starting in any order? Or Toby, the politician, yeah. you better go first. <laughs> sure, Lord, Lord Harris. <laughs> um, I think at the moment, the value system that we operate doesn't place enough value on the societal position of a business. So that um, the immediate concern of the directors, the immediate concern of the, of the entity is survival, or con conceivably, this is so existential, actually, we might just as well pack up and go home. Um, but that does not necessarily reflect the val necessarily reflect the value that their activities have for the rest of society. And so we need to find a way, of first of all, recognizing that. And you know, yes, at, a low, at the simplest level, having to report in your annual report what you are doing about your societal responsibilities is helpful. But actually, it's about institutionalizing that making that a necessary thing that needs to be done. And it also requires an ability to place a value on resilience and preparedness, which at the moment we can't really do. Um, because that could then justify the investment I talked about to remove, you know, to, to uh, build in redundancy, to build in the, every, everything else that you might need. Um, and, and it would satisfy shareholders that you were doing that. And the absence of that then becomes a concern for shareholders and those, those who are investing. Because at the moment, the driving factor is, what is the return going to be in the next quarter? What are the earnings figures are? How can we maximize those? Rather than recognizing that unless you invest in things which don't have an immediate return, your organization may be destroyed further down the line, unless you've taken that out of. So how you report that, how you record that, and how you measure that, I think are important, uh, important tests. I'm sure the National Resilience Strategy, when it's produced, will cover this and find the magic solution uh, which, will, um, enable this, which will enable this to happen. But it is a critical question. And if you think about it in terms of, in, think about it in terms of cyber, I talked about um, it's wh where the weakest link is you may be the weakest link as an entity, as an organization, or as an individual, but you may not regard yourself as particularly important. So why on earth should you, as an organization, be investing at a high level in this degree of cybersecurity? Um, and yet, if you get it wrong, you're bringing down a whole chunk of society. I see. No, really helpful. Thank you. And I guess, Patty and, and Josh, do you have further comments on that? Anything you would agree with or maybe challenge? So, so I, I, I'm sure in the Q&A we'll get to talking about ransomware. I'm sure we will. I'm sure it'll come up. But I want to say something about it that, that's very um, powerful in my mind. So I noticed that in ransomware events, when you have an interaction with authorities, and this isn't only in the UK jurisdiction, it's more generally across Europe and in, and in the United States, there is a punitive, or I would call it blame-storming, yeah. <laughs> approach to the victim. Right? When that victim is a provider of services, and our societal interest is in keeping them functioning, if there are, you know, I've worked with food packaging firms, I've worked with transport, I've worked, I can go through the sectors, all of which are on the CNI mm. list in one way, or critical national infrastructure list in one way in the UK. During the pandemic, we understood absolutely that we needed to support business when they were beset by difficulties with staff and economic pressure, and we poured money onto them and supported them. When they have a ransomware event, we beat them up as if they're recalcitrant, even though they're the same businesses. So you look at that and think, hmm, we aren't quite getting this right. Yeah. Particularly when, and we could talk about this separately, as a society, we're not doing terribly well with fraud and, and extortion and that kind of crime. So it's not as if there's a ready um, you know, support for the individual or for businesses when they're subjected to this, which is what they're dealing with. Ransomware is so fundamentally different from the kind of data and money stealing that was going on previously and is aimed because of the Darwinian effect of our cyber efforts around financial services at increasingly more vulnerable elements, uh, whether it be the health sector, whether it be you know, food distribution, 
I, I could think of a whole set of them I've had to work on recently. So, so to my mind, there is a big question. You know, it's, it is absolutely about the value of the business, and we've got schizophrenia, because one place it's valuable, another place it isn't. Yeah. I, I would completely agree with all those comments, and maybe just echo them by, by saying, I think one of the things that occurs to me whenever we have a chance to sort of speak with or look at a, a, a room full of uh, participants and contributors like this is that every one of our entities and companies is at its heart today a technology company or entity and all of us are interdependently linked to each other in some s sort of ecosystem on which the rest of us depend. So even not necessarily critical entities in an institution that at least we might not define as, as critical by virtue of the place they or the role that they play may be critical for something that another critical entity does, which brings us back to this sort of herd immunity topic. I think incredibly important for us to recognize the institutional power of being able to get the kinds of incentives and also structures right that raises the level of cybersecurity, resiliency, and preparedness across the entire society, but in a way that starts to finally bend the curve of cybercrime so it at least stops rising like in this shape, right, and starts to level and maybe hopefully in time to clients. I think the other thing I'd say is just, again, considering the audience and the opportunity we have to think and reflect on this here, London is, of course, a global financial hub, and we have the opportunity here to sort of think and reflect about some of the ways that some of the financial incentives, as Lord Harris mentioned, um, shape some of the way that ways that entities operate. I mean, as we think about the ransomware, for example, and the role that certain standards for resiliency, like Sheltered Harbor, which I think was, was mentioned by Dane earlier, but also some of the frameworks for the way that we incentivize institutions to invest in cybersecurity, not just to put it off balance sheet as a sort of an unknown invisible risk that can't be quantified, as, as we were saying. We change that framing a little bit, we get the opportunity to really drive the kinds of change that I think really can meaningfully impact the way that society becomes more resilient to cyber threats like we're describing. Thank you, thank you all for answering that. And I think that the answer seems to be yes, we do need to look at how we build cyber resilience. We do have that social responsibility to do so, but there might be a few changes we need to make in terms of how we incentivize that from a leadership perspective and also from a business perspective. And as you said, Josh, kind of make technology a part of everyone's discussion. How are we safeguarding um, consumers um, today? So really appreciate it. Thank you to the panelists. I, I think it would be a great time now to say goodbye to our friends on Zoom. Um, great to have you on and thank you for joining.